This is Lisa Elwine, and welcome back to our series, 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy, A Better Resurrection. In our last program, we learned about chiasms, how a chiasm is a, a kind of a mirror of itself. And it's important to learn about chiasms because so much of Scripture, like we saw in the book of Daniel, is actually in the pattern of a chiasm. And once we can locate that chiasm, then we can find the axis. We can find the essence of the message. We can find that nugget that really helps us to understand what the whole big picture is in that context. And we also ended with a passage that comes from Ezekiel 128. And that's important because we looked at the menorah as a kind of a chiasm as a mirror image of itself, as being able to see the menorah as an earthly view, as a natural and physical view, but then seeing the rainbow atop it as having more of a spiritual point of view of the menorah. And in that sense, it's a chiasm. One is a mirror of the other, the spiritual and the natural. And the reason for looking at the menorah or the rainbow as an essential part of understanding the resurrection is we have to remember where we came from. The whole idea of the garden was to have life. It was the perfect place of life for Adam and Eve. But when they fell out of the garden, then it was going to require a crossing over to get back into that ideal location, the Garden of Eden. And thus we have the idea of a Hebrew, somebody who crosses over. Abraham is iconic of that faith, that we can indeed cross back into the Garden, that the place that Adam and Eve fell out of is the place that we will be restored to eventually through the work of Yeshua we can fulfill that, that perfect meaning of what it means to be a Hebrew, one who crosses over. We can indeed cross back into the garden. So we want to go back and look at our first mention of the garden and its description. So that's uh, the context we have of reading from this passage in Ezekiel 128 where it says, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so is the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So we know the garden is a reflection. What we might call the lower garden or the Garden of Eden was actually a reflection, and we'll see that uh, as we continue with our study, of an upper garden. It's a mirror of something that's happening higher in a higher realm. But then this water flows out from the throne of the upper garden and it goes down into the Garden of Eden, it says, and it gives drink to the whole garden. So it's important to understand the structure as much as we can of the Garden of Eden because that's where our resurrection will be too at least one stage of it, will be back into this garden. So let's look at another scripture. This time, let's look at Revelation 4, 3, because I think it helps us to visualize even better what Ezekiel says that he saw. He saw a surrounding radiance. So in Revelation, it says, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. So both of these passages are showing us, in terms of the menorah, what it looks like when it's complete. That we as human beings are made uniquely in the creation. We have both a physical, natural body that houses a spiritual one. And unlike many of the other creations, like say the angels, or specific classes of angels, 
the Holy One wanted us to be able to function equally as well in either a physical, natural, or a spiritual realm. And that's what the Garden of Eden was. It was both natural and spiritual. And you say, well, if it was natural, where is it? Well, at this point, it's concealed. That's why you really only get half the picture when you look at a menorah. You don't really see the rainbow because when we fell, our vision also fell. It requires at this point lifting your eyes, as it says in scripture, to be able to see into that spiritual realm. But when you can lift your eyes, like many people in scripture, then you can see into that realm. They saw lots of things in that realm that had a very physical appearance, but yet it's spiritual too. And it represents at the restoration, at the resurrection, how we'll have access to both of those levels once again. So that mirror-like depiction of heaven and earth it's giving us a description of the Garden of Eden at the creation. It's interesting that the text says a river flowed out of Eden and watered the whole garden. That doesn't make sense. Because if the river flows out, then how can it water the whole garden? Only if that river is flowing out of a higher Eden. If there is a heavenly Eden above, we might call it an upper garden. And from there, that river is going to flow out of that upper garden and water, or it specifically says it gives drink to that lower garden that's described to us in the book of Genesis. So let's go back and let's read that account so we can get fixed in our minds this circular pattern of the Garden of Eden. So every time you look in a, at a menorah from now on, it should transform the way that you look at the menorah. That you'll, you'll be able not just to see the physical menorah, but with your spiritual eye. You'll also be able to see the spiritual aspect of the menorah and the seven spirits of Adonai. So it says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there, it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around. That Hebrew word there is sovev, which means to circle. So the passage there is describing to us the circular pattern of the Garden of Eden. Why does that matter? If you understand how the rivers circled or survived, we've got Pishon right here. And then inside of here, you have the Gihon, which is another river. And then there's an interior river called the Chidakel or the Tigris um, in English. But then it also says there was a tree, a tree of life in the middle of the garden. So these outer two rivers, it says very specifically, they circled. They went round and round. But of the inner one, it, it describes it a little bit differently. It says it holech in Hebrew, which means it walked. So this inner river, this smaller one here, because you know, if it's smaller, it would actually move a little faster. But this one is actually walking around the tree of life in the center of the garden. If you've ever done a study on what it means to walk in the word, then that should give you a great visual because it is the walk that brings you closest to the tree of life in the center of the garden. It's your walk in the word. But there's these surrounding rivers. And it says, um, again, going back to Revelation 22, 
1 through 2. We'll go back to Revelation again. It says, He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So now it's telling us about the source river, how a river could flow out of Eden and still water Eden to water the whole garden. Because there is a river of the water of life. Let's say this is the river coming down. It says it's clear as crystal. Uh, and it's coming from the throne of God. And according to Jewish sources, that river is actually coming from beneath the throne. And so it comes from beneath the throne and it descends into this lower garden, which is both spiritual and physical. And uh, it says in the middle of its street, on either side of the river was the tree of life. Hmm. Okay, there again is a chiasm. There is a mirror. There's a tree that's on either side of the river. It's, it's on both sides. But the tree's in the center of the garden. So how can it be on both sides? You can see it if you can see the chiasm right there. It says, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So... Again, if you just know a few basic Hebrew words, and you can use your Strong's Concordance to look them up, it opens up that picture of the, the Garden of Eden to where you can actually visualize perhaps how that river flows down from the throne. It divides into four heads, and all of a sudden, now it's circling around the Tree of Life. <clears throat> and if you understand that pattern, it also helps you visualize the wheel within the wheel that Ezekiel saw. He's like, he said, there's fiery coals in there, but he was allowed to reach in there to get some of those fiery coals. Uh, that's a great study in itself. But at least there also makes sense how those living beings, if these rivers are like wheels within the wheel, it says they can move in any direction without having to turn. And see, if you can visualize this entire menorah with both the natural and the spiritual as the whole rainbow, then you can see how certain wheels would move it without it actually having to turn because they can turn in those directions just like that. Um, and by the way, they're still circling. Those rivers of Eden are still circling just above us just above Jerusalem, just above the land of Israel. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about the land of Israel. There's no place in Scripture that doesn't either lead you to or return you to the land, and then specifically the city of Jerusalem. So there is a land, there is a covenant, and there is a people. You start dividing those things out and you've actually lost the whole context of the Bible itself. And so the idea is with that garden hovering just above Israel, that's why the whole thing is go back to Israel, go back to Israel, go back to Jerusalem, go why? Because we were kicked out of the garden and Yeshua came to restore us to the garden. The feasts of Israel are part of that journey. Once you recognize that, once you see that it's more than a bunch of rules and regulations and checking off boxes and having great meals or starving to death for one day a year, once you see it as more than just on a physical level, once you start to understand what the natural eye can't see about those feasts, is that you must go back to Jerusalem to celebrate them. He keeps drawing you back to Jerusalem. Why? Because Israel itself is a beautiful place. It has pretty places, but as far as countries go, it's no more beautiful than anywhere else in the natural realm. But when you go to Israel and something happens in your spirit, and all of a sudden you know you're home, it's because you're seeing what is not there. It's just like Yeshua, it says he had no form that we should desire him. 
In other words, Yeshua wasn't this great, wonderful, handsome man that people could look at him like King Saul and say, oh, he was born to be king. No, he says he was despised of men. Why? Because we look with natural eyes. But if those who saw Yeshua with spiritual eyes, they understood. And that's what we have to see about the land of Israel. It's rocks. It's just rocks and rocks and more rocks and rocks have baby rocks at night. And then you get up the next morning, there's more rocks. In the physical realm, there's not that much to be desired. But if in your spirit you know that there is something just above there, that one day you're going to be able to see what is actually there, that he will take that desert and turn it into a garden, just like the prophet says, then you're beginning to get the idea of this menorah. You're starting to get that full picture, that, that spirit of heaven circling the throne like a rainbow, like Ezekiel sees and like John sees, and then that river of the Holy Spirit flowing from under the throne, and then circling around the Garden of Eden, and how you could drink from those rivers of the Holy Spirit, just like Yeshua said, you come to me and drink. He will give you drink. It's, it's always been about the Spirit, and if you can't drink from the Spirit, you're surely never going to see the spiritual aspect of Israel. And you're going to disdain it. You're going to deride it. You're going to try to demote it in terms of value because you don't understand what's just above it that's calling you home. But that's, it's important to understand this because this resting place that we're going to return to, this restoration that we're going to experience, he wants to take us not just where we can believe that there is a garden there, but that so our faith is so strong in Yeshua and his power to resurrect us from the dead that we could actually re-enter that garden and be with him forever. What do you say? And thus shall we be with the Lord forever in that cloud. So that's why we need to go back to the cloud. Once we understand the garden, we need to begin kind of decoding this cloud language. Uh, Yeshua used um, a lot of language that would help us understand. Like he said to the thief on the cross next to him, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is the third heaven, according to Paul. I'm not sure what that makes numbers one and two, but Number three is going to be the Garden of Eden. And they're not that far away from it as they have that conversation on the cross. Uh, this post-mortem experience for a believer might be a little different than that, like the other, the non-believer, the other thief who's basically railing against Yeshua and Yeshua didn't do anything wrong. And then this one sticks. He says, basically, he's making a proclamation of faith in Yeshua and saying he's innocent. And you know what John says? He says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst, it's in the middle of the paradise of God. And so Yeshua is calling that thief. He's saying, come and eat from the tree of life. You're going to be able to cross over. You have made a proclamation of your faith in the resurrection and in a proclamation that Yeshua is innocent. And because of that innocence, he is the way that we cross back over. And so you can see how just being interested in the rapture is not going to suffice. Just thinking that I guess you're going to be floating on a cloud strumming a harp or something. That's not really the resurrection. There's much more to it. It's, it's wider, it's broader, it's deeper than the average reader wants to explore. They just want the short answer. They just want <laughs> a quick answer. Don't make me work too hard. But we're going to have to investigate these clouds, the clouds of glory, 
to understand death, burial, resurrection, and to even get a better contextual view of this event called the resurrection. So let's look at probably the most common proof text uh, for the resurrection. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Okay, let's just use that. If we'll take this, there should be words in the hood, right? And the words in the hood here, we should be able to go back to the Torah and also find these words in the hood. Where there's a relationship among these words that keeps appearing and appearing and appearing that would tell us we're on the right track. Because what Paul writes after he says this, he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. So in describing this catching up, this ascension, well, at the same time, it says the Lord is descending. Paul says this should be a source of comfort. That's not often what you hear about the rapture. You, you tend to hear it more frequently in terms of trying to terrify people into heaven. But the point of Paul sharing this is he says, is for you to comfort one another. And I think the more comfort believers have in this event, the more those who have not made that proclamation of faith will be attracted to the message instead of being scared in or scared into disbelief instead of neutrality, because we can move people one of two directions by our behavior and by our words. But if they see how much comfort we take in this, they're going to be curious. And it's, it's much better for people to come to Yeshua out of love than out of terror. And so let's take responsibility for this passage and do exactly what Paul says. Let's comfort ourselves with this belief in the resurrection. But at the same time, let's find out what it means. Because if we're just using the word, and we don't even know what it means exactly, and somebody out here who might be riding the fence says, well, what do you mean by resurrection? I've heard of the rapture. What's the resurrection? That's your opportunity to comfort and to invite and to faith in Yeshua. So when Yeshua resurrects, remember that he's walking with the disciples on the Emmaus Road. They don't know who he is, which, by the way, that's one of the, the Jewish traditions is that uh, once you die, your appearance is so different that even those who know you may not recognize you at first. It's, it's an odd intersection there. But the disciples don't recognize him at first. So he walks along. They're bent out of shape and in the funniest line of all time. Uh, don't think Yeshua didn't have a sense of humor. These disciples are walking along, talking about what's happened with the crucifixion and so forth. And Yeshua's like, hey, what's going on, guys? And they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's been going on? You don't know about these things? And he says, what things? <laughs> it's like he wasn't the thing. But they don't recognize him. So he has to explain himself. And the text says he explains himself beginning with Moses. And that's what we want to do. We want to start with the Torah so we can understand Yeshua's primary text. Because if Yeshua's primary text isn't our primary text, then we may not be opening the eyes we should. Because once he explained himself beginning with Moses, by the time they sit down for the blessing, on the meal, their eyes are open. And they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Why? Because he started with Moses. And if we have run away from that most powerful message of the first century, 
believers, which was the resurrection from the dead, and being able to explain it in this kind of language like Yeshua from the Torah, no wonder we're losing people. You know, you might gain a soul, but you'll lose 10 more. Why? We've left behind the power of this message. And Yeshua had the power. He is the power of this message. So here's our key words that Paul gave us. The Lord himself descends. Descend is a key word. That's going to be one of our words we look for in the hood. The dead ascend. They go up. That's going to be one of our key words in the hood. He also says the saints will go up with them. Okay, again, that's in that same little uh, contextual bundle as the dead ascending, because also the saints, it's going up. It says, they meet the Lord in the cloud together. The cloud is something we have to study. We have to keep tabs on the cloud because there's going to be different manifestations of the cloud. If we, we only study one cloud and say we understand the resurrection, we've probably missed the meaning of some, some of these other clouds. It says they dwell with the Lord forever. They live in the cloud. You're thinking, well, didn't you just say we're not going to be floating on clouds playing harps? Not in the traditional sense, but you may remain in the cloud once you find out exactly what the cloud is and what it is not. And it would be a place you would want to dwell. And finally, he says, these words are comforting. We should find them as a source of comfort, which again takes us back to the power of the Holy Spirit, like we saw in the menorah, in the rivers of Eden, in the feasts. The Holy Spirit is also referred to as a comforter. So Paul is telling us if we don't engage this at a spiritual level, it may not be a source of comfort to us. It, it just may be discouraging to us. But once we see the spiritual aspect of the resurrection, starting with Moses, letting Moses teach us about the resurrection in the wilderness, and helping us to see Yeshua in each of these Torah portions, and how he resurrects in these Torah portions, then they should be a source of eternal comfort. And they should be so comfortable that we're willing to share them with others. So our proof texts are going to involve studying clouds, what it means to go up. We're going to go back to the Torah for the seeds. Remember the third day seeds and the trees that grow out of the seeds and then they bear fruit. So we're going to start with the Torah and look at those seeds in the Torah. And then from there, we'll have a great foundation. And then we can proceed to the prophets where the resurrection language is a little more specific and a little harder to miss. But where did the prophets get these ideas? They got them from the Torah and they got them through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, in the prophets, it's not a brand new idea, resurrection. It's simply building on the idea that was there from Genesis 1. So we're going to go Torah, then we're going to look at the prophets, and then that's going to help us to understand the Bichadasha, the New Testament. And along with this, we again, we're going to apply some historical context. Um, it really is vital to look at the Jewish viewpoint of the resurrection, um, because that's going to give us, like we say, these intersections, like the rabbis say that, that once you cross over, you're very difficult to recognize in your new form. And that's exactly what we see with this uh, post-resurrection appearance of Yeshua, is his own disciples are having trouble recognizing him until their spiritual eyes are opened. Um, and they can see that, that upper aspect of the resurrection. Um, but he had to remind them what Moses said about it and the prophets before they could engage it at their New Testament level. And that's what we, we want to repeat that pattern. Explain it with Moses. 
explain it in the prophets. And I think that's going to give us a new joy and vitality when we study the New Testament scriptures, because then we'll have that good foundation like Yeshua laid.